Welcome everyone to today's webinar. I am Emma Goodman with Becker's Healthcare. We will begin today's webinar with a presentation and we'll have time at the end of the hour for a question and answer session. You can submit any questions you have throughout the webinar by typing them into your control panel in the space labeled enter a question for staff and clicking send. We're looking forward to hearing your questions. Additionally, in about a week following the webinar, we will be sending you a copy of the presentation to the email you use to register. At this time, it is now my pleasure to start today's webinar by introducing our presenter. Barley Turanda, a nurse, is the social media manager of IPAC Canada and the current president of IPAC GTA. He is also the National Healthcare Sales Director and Infection Control Specialist with Clorox Canada. He is certified in infection prevention and control and has worked extensively in infection control. Barley has been an integral, Barley has been an integral uh, part to the successful decline of C. diff infections through implementing innovative technology and quality improvement behavioral change. In addition, Barley is a volunteer infection control specialist with the C. diff foundation. Now it is my pleasure to turn the floor over to Barley to begin today's webinar. Thank you very much for that warm introduction and uh, good morning and good afternoon uh, to everyone on the line. Um, I will be going through the presentation today uh, titled To Use or Not to Use Procidal Agents Everywhere. Uh, I'll just start off with some disclosures. I am an employee of Clorox Healthcare, as already been stated. I volunteer with IPAC Canada in many roles. Uh, as well, I'm a volunteer with the CEDA Foundation. Uh, the views expressed are those of uh, my own views and uh, do not reflect the organizations that I belong to. However, the funding of this talk has been made possible by Clorox Healthcare. Um, we're going to go through a couple of different things on this talk today. Uh, the agenda is listed as follows. Uh, I'm going to review the background of C. difficile and the interventions aimed at preventing uh, transmission. I'm going to discuss the current state and the challenges leading to sustained transmission of C. difficile. I'm also going to go through a discussion of uh, universal sporicidal uh, use as a strategy to reduce transmission of C. difficile. Uh, in addition to that, I'm also going to highlight some of the future considerations that you have to take uh, attention to, uh, and then we're going to end up with the opportunity to ask questions. So just a bit of a background, really. C. difficile has become one of the most significant pathogens in, in, in acute care uh, in hospital settings in North America. Um, in addition to that, a 2015 report released by the Center of Disease uh, Control and Prevention, the CDC, uh, uh, noted that nearly 500,000 Americans suffer from C. difficile infections in a single year, in which one in five of those patients can exhibit recurrence. In addition to that, the epidemiology of C. difficile infection has evolved within the last decade, costing hospitals upwards of $4.8 billion each year in excess healthcare costs. Although most of the C. difficile infections are healthcare related, a percentage, approximately about 35% of those, occur in the community and appear to be unrelated at all to antibiotic use or any prior hospital uh, exposure. Nearly 1 to 3% of healthcare, healthy adults, sorry, and 15 to 20% of infants are asymptomatic. So they are, they are C. diff carriers and they, they carry C. diff as part of their normal gut, uh, microbial gut uh, community. And despite all we have and despite proactive infection control measures, such as hand hygiene, antimicrobial stewardship, environmental cleaning, C. difficile associated disease still remains problematic. So this is the back, back, background in terms of what we're working with. In terms of uh, just transitioning a little bit to some of the interventions that are recommended for reduction of hospital-acquired uh, C. difficile, um, they are you will be familiar with uh, breaking the chain of transmission, and this is something that uh, is, is is something that all infection prevention control and all people in in, in healthcare settings are, are, are geared to do. One of the things you want to be able to do is is have hand hygiene and proper hand hygiene compliance. Unfortunately, in, in studies that are looking at healthcare. Uh, 
and hygiene, it's noticed that the compliance is always on the low. Um, and this is for a variety of reasons and as such, depending on the studies that you look at, hand hygiene compliance can range anywhere from the low 30s to the high 90s with variable factors such as Hawthorne effect contributing to the hand hygiene. Contact precautions is another piece of the power as well as far as reducing the chain of transmission. And this is another measure that is listed as a, as a strategy to reduce seed of soil transmission. Uh, prompt identification of cases is also another key thing that needs to be done. In addition, uh, appropriate use of antibiotics is a key measure. Environmental disinfection is also a piece, and this is where I will spend most of the talk today, particularly focused on uh, sporicidal agents as, as far as their inter intervention, as far as reducing C. difficile. But I would like to point out that as much as all these interventions listed here, one, two, five, are uh, interventions that actually uh, reduce C. difficile and all have shown to, to be part of a multimodal strategy. Today my focus will be on the fifth one which is environmental disinfection and in particular use of sporicidal agents. So a couple of takeaways from the guidance documents that currently exist and I've listed the guidance documents below. Uh, pretty much as I, uh, 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 key takeaways are cases are on the rise, C. difficile spread is, is complex, uh, you need an EPA registered sporicide in cases where you have a C. difficile disinfection need. Uh, item four is C. difficile management is multifactorial, which speaks to the point the earlier on the earlier slide with all those multiple interventions that need to be done. In addition, it's a multi-collaborative effort, including a lot of people that are working on the strategy. There's a state of concern related to a couple of different things, on, and some of them are concern around community cases. I'm gonna dive deeper into that a bit. The role of asymptomatic carriage I want to go in a bit more on that, and then human factors related to possible errors. And last but not least is around perform environmental decontamination of rooms of patients with CDI using approved sporicidal agent, especially in an, in an outbreak or hyperendemic setting. So this is what the guidance documents are speaking to at the present moment, but what I'm going to do is dive a little bit deeper and speak to some of the challenges related to the recommendations and how there might be an opportunity to do over and above. So right now, in terms of like an infection control plan, infection control strategy is typically fed by any one of these key things. So starting from the left, you've got the guidance documents, you've got Occupational Health and Safety Act and the guidance documents related to that. You've got all the way a plethora of things that actually feed the guidance documents and the process uh, of managing C. difficile in a facility. With all these moving pieces, uh, one thing that's really clear is that we seem to know the strategy of how to fight C. difficile. And in addition to that, if you look, there's additional guidance documents uh, that I've just uh, taken a pick off. But these are some of the guidance documents that are, people actually use. A lot of people will be familiar with these. Um, but one of the two of the biggest conclusions out of this is there's lots of guidance documents right now that govern how to manage C. difficile. In addition to that, we already know how to fight C. difficile. So given this backstory, we have uh, continual rising cases, but we've got guidance documents that, that create a disconnect somehow between how come we have all these guidance documents and all these processes that are recommended, but we continue to see a spike in cases. So in terms of where we are now, just, to, just a bit more information just to point out again uh, in terms of the complexity and impact of C. difficile. Uh, 450,000 uh, cases, according to a CDC funded study uh, in 2000, uh, 2011, uh, 450,000 uh, patients were found to have annual uh, cases of C. difficile infection on an annual basis. Out of those, 29,000 deaths were attributed to C. difficile. This resulted in a billion dollars in excess cost annually, with about 35% of those patients actually attributed to the community and no previous hospital admission. This is a point prevalence and tells you a snapshot, but what is the trend? So the trend is when you look at a 10-year retrospective U.S. patient discharge uh, chart review, two things were noted. One, the incidence of the C. difficile among hospitalized adults in the United States nearly doubled from 2001 to 2010, yet there is little evidence of improvement in patient mortality or hospital length of stay. So given all this that we know so far, 
we are seeing increased rates, but why are transmission rates not improving? So I would like to pose two hypotheses, and I'm going to bucket them into, I'm going to bucket them as far as outpatient challenges, and I'm also going to bucket them into inpatient challenges. For the sake of my talk, and as you looked at the, uh, the focus of this talk, it's going to spend more time on the inpatient, but I'll just go a little bit really quickly on outpatient, just to give you a backstory in terms of what's happening in, in the home. But as I said, most of the focus is going to be on inpatient. So a typical patient in the home or people in the community right now are faced with multiple sources of potential C. difficile transmission and contamination. Uh, starting from the left, you've got tainted food sources that have been identified to have uh, means to spread C. difficile. Patients that have been prior hospitalized are at increased risk of actually having C. difficile, even ongoing transmission within the community. Outpatient antibiotics administered through dentistry or any other outpatient uh, methods uh, uh, pose people to have increased risk of transmission. Having an infant in the household, uh, especially if you're less than two years old, where the, the, the gut and microbiome is known to have C. difficile as part of its normal flora, increases your risk of actually having C. difficile. The soil, water, uh, two sources that are being found consistently in much literature to actually have uh, C. difficile associated with those. And last but not least is pets. Many pets uh, have been found to actually have pathogenic forms of C. difficile and this is part of their normal flora. So when you look at all these, there's an onslaught of C. difficile presence within the community and it's no doubt then that you actually have uh, uh, it's uh, such a clinical picture of epidemiology. So this imagery uh, shown here is a paper uh, by Vivian Liu, um, which was published in New England Journal of Medicine in 20, 2000, sorry, 2011. And what it shows is in a typical random sample, 3 to 5 percent of the general population test positive for C. difficile. So to make it imagery friendly, if you see the little guy in red there, that would be a, in a typical sample population, 1 in 20 would have a C. difficile. And this is for the general public. So if you're looking at why rates are not falling, we've talked a little bit about the outpatient challenges. And based on, on those outpatient challenges, you have a rough understanding now that most of those patients that are coming into the facility in a healthcare setting might already have C. difficile either symptomatically or might be, uh, might be infected with C. difficile. So let's talk a little bit about the inpatient challenges and have a bit of a conversation in terms of what that looks like. So, there's current challenges in C. difficile ma management in inpatient uh, hospital management, and I think I tried to summarize them here, and I'll just list them here, but I'm going to go through one by one as, uh, over the next couple of slides just to try and shed more clarity. But for anybody that's practiced or is currently working in a, in a healthcare setting, some of these things will be, will be already uh, familiar to you. I'm going to talk about the complex transmission related to C. difficile. I'm also going to talk about the tenacity and the de general challenge of this uh, complicated uh, bacteria that is C. difficile. I will launch into the microbiology testing and the challenges that that poses. Um, I'm going to speak to environmental disinfection as well as environmental contributions. I'll close out with the five and six, which is the infection control lapses, as well as the role of asymptomatic or C. difficile carriers. So let's talk, talk a little bit about the complexity. So a typical hospital setting looks something like this. You've got patients coming through the hospital entrance. Uh, they come through emergency department, or they can come through registration. Any place that they go to can be a potential place that they can seed. However, there is this uh, notion that by isolating them in, in, for example, in this case, in that part that's orange there, that then that's the magical way in which we can actually contain the C. difficile in that particular setting. But what we're consistently finding is that they, they can be migration of C. difficile throughout the picture. So to put it another way, up to 50% of people, people admitted to hospital could be C. difficile positive. In addition to that, 50% of surfaces in a C. difficile patient's room were positive after cleaning. The other thing is, and, and this is consistent with the survey that, that was done, if you notice, if you remember when you were registering, you had an opportunity to do a survey. I'll share some of the results of those, but it was interesting to note that many of the people that participated in the survey today or, or during the registration time actually identified that they have had delayed isolation and, it, and the delayed detection of C. difficile patients. All these factors all lead to the challenges that actually presented in, in managing C. difficile. So what does that do from a, from a 
epidemiology perspective. Well, this is a study done in 2007, and I think we're getting scarier pictures building up over the, the, the last little while. But one of the things that's being found out is up to 50% of the adults in an inpatient can test positive for uh, for C. difficile. So if you're looking at a typical inpatient unit with about 20 people in there, it's about 10 people that can actually have C. difficile uh, and test positive for C. difficile. Switching gears a little bit to, to acknowledge the challenge of C. difficile, if you notice here to the right is an increase in resistance. You notice C. difficile sits at the very top there as far as one of the bacterial spores and one of the tougher things to kill and disinfect. If you look to the right, there's a table that speaks to how long C. difficile can last. You're looking at five months. So this is something that just points into the complexity of C. difficile and how tenacious it is as a, as a bacteria in terms of how it can thrive and stay in the environment for a long time. This is one of the things I'm finding a lot of interest in, and I think a lot of work is being done now to try and understand why are we continuing to see cases despite the fact that we're doing all the key measures required. So a lot of work is being done now around prior room occupants. Who was in that room before you, and what did they do, or what was unique about that particular patient that, that, that could have affected the, the next person coming in? So as, so as what we know, and anybody that has worked in a healthcare setting knows, typically when a person has C. difficile is found C positive, they will move that patient into another bed or into another room. But what we now know is up to 50% chance that a person that was in a prior bed gets moved into the next room. The person that's going to occupy the bed that had the positive patient is at up to 50% chance of actually picking up the same pathogen that that patient had. So this is something that's important to note. But in addition to that, there's been a meta-analysis that was done, I cited down there at the bottom by Mitchell and Anderson and et al. And what they noticed is they did a, a meta-analysis, which was a combination of looking at all the comprehensive uh, data that's available right now on, 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 on prior room occupants. And they noticed that it's overwhelmingly clear that the prior uh, when we put a patient in a room that previously housed a patient with C. difficile, there's high risk of acquisition. In addition to that, uh, the current environmental cleaning practices fail to reduce the risk of acquisition as spores can be airborne up to 48 hours after discharge. So as much as you might clean the room, spores can sit and linger for a while such that when they settle back down and you now deviate back to the non-sporicidal product, you actually open yourself up to challenges. The last piece was just, this is a new study that just came out. It's by Friedberg and uh, came out in JAMA in, in, in October, uh, sorry, last month. And it was actually a very, it was, it was a well-discussed uh, uh, journal at ID Week last week. And a lot of people were actually finding this interesting. But what they noticed is receipt of antibiotics by a prior bed occupant was associated with increased risk of C. difficile in subsequent patients. So antibiotics themselves can directly affect risk of C. difficile patients even though they do not themselves they did not themselves receive antibiotics. So this is something that is really new and very interesting and adds to the layer of complexity around C. difficile management. So it makes it more important for us to be thinking about how can we be having interventions that are more horizontal than the targeted intervention strategies that we've been deploying of late. Stool management is a key thing, and as I said, I'm really looking at all the key things that are facing in healthcare and the challenges that are being faced. And this is a study by Best and the Best uh, and Wilcox and out of England. And what they looked at is the potential of airborne dispersal of C. difficile from symptomatic patients. And they noticed that when you flush a toilet, uh, C. difficile was recoverable from air sampled at heights of up to 25 centimeters above the toilet seat. In addition to that, they noticed that contamination could permit transmission of C. difficile from asymptomatic carriers and thereby explain some of the C. difficile cases uh, where there was no ap apparent uh, linked C. difficile cases to be found. So you might not be able to explain some of the C. difficile cases that you're finding because some of this might be related to aerosolized stool from down the hallway. One of the things that they made is a strong recommendation in this paper, but what I, which I continue to see as a, as a challenge in many for older facilities is lidless conventional toilets. Uh, they said, sorry, they concluded that lidless, lidless conventional toilets increase the risk of C. difficile environmental contamination. And they, in this paper, suggested that the, the use of lidless toilets is discouraged, particularly in settings where C. difficile is common. But consistently, this is something that is in place, and I think most people might have these in their facilities. 
So all this to say, there is multiple players that are involved in city fiscal management. And having said at many outbreak meetings, uh, one of the things I was got to realize is there is many stakeholders that are that are in there. But one of the things that was interesting is out of the survey that I sent out with the with the with the registration, it was nice to note. Um, it was nice to note that. Uh, it was nice to note that in cases when you have to use sporocidal agents, is there ever a delay initiating a switch to sporocidal products from non sporocidal And 30% of the people that were surveyed said yes. The additional question now asked was, are there ever gaps that lead to failure to use sporocidal agents for seed official patients? And 40% answered yes or sometimes. Both these questions, some of the smaller, small print uh, answers that were given were related to challenges related to communication and the multiple stakeholders that are involved in the process. So let's switch gears a little bit and speak to asymptomatic carriage. And I think this is an important piece because typically when a person is exposed to C. difficile or is exposed to antibiotics, they take one of two forms. Either they become colonized and have no symptoms, or they become infected and asymptomatic. Historically, all the literature and all the focus has been on the symptomatic infected patient. However, there has now been an increasing body of work speaking to the role of that colonized no symptoms patient, because that patient can still continue to seed the environment and add to the complexity of seed episode transmission. So, uh, this is uh, out of Guerrero et al. They wrote a paper in 2013, and they say the current guidance suggests isolation should continue until 48 hours after diarrhea resolution, but their data showed that the potential of transmission persisted for up to eight weeks. The other thing that was noted was uh, by Walker et al., they did a paper looking at the characterization and the gene sequencing of C. difficile cases, and they noticed that in an outbreak, the outbreaks have been linked to asymptomatic patients, which is those patients uh, in the orange that we have not paid attention to in the past. One third of C. difficile transmissions arise from asymptomatic carriers, and there is, and there is a severe underestimation of the role of these patients. 45% of C. difficile cases are genetically unrelated. So if you look at all this, this is new presenting information. In the last little while, we're looking at papers from 2013 to 2016 that are showing this and, 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 and creating a significant challenge. The other piece that adds complexity is, is it real C. diff, is it not? And the tools that people have at their disposal are subjective tools. So sometimes somebody looks at a stool sample, they call it a type 6, somebody calls it a type 7. Sometimes people actually have a huge debate, is it three stools, is it two stools? Like it's difficult when somebody is incontinent products, uh, incontinent briefs to actually have the, the, the appropriate uh, sub, uh, uh, objective method to actually contain and diagnose that C. diff cell. In addition now, with microbiology, there is now sensitive tests that complicate whether the person is actually colonized or is not colonized. In addition to that, if you look at C. difficile lab diagnosis, there's many ways of actually going about testing, but I'll simplify it for you guys right now and say at the bottom there that uh, according to Crowback and Wilcox, when they did a comprehensive analysis of all the potential commercial tests, they, com they, co they confirmed that no single commercial test alone can be used as a standalone test for diagnosing C. difficile. In addition, they therefore concluded that you need to use a two-step process. So you're looking at microbiology being a challenge in terms of diagnosing for this, but I wanted to focus a bit around on the cleaning and why cleaning itself can pose a, a, a bit of a challenge. So if you're looking at this, C. difficile was recovered on up to 50% of the sites in the patient rooms that had previously occupied a, a, a C. difficile room, and also on 29% of the sites in rooms occupied by asymptomatic carriers. In addition to that, computers and touch screens can be potential reservoirs for opportunistic pathogens in hospitals. Unfortunately, most of these devices have very um, subpar recommendations speaking to use of mild soap, lint-free cloth, and water, and, and gentle water, which unfortunately does not bode well with dealing with, with uh, harsh uh, bugs like we do with C. cell. In addition, 
one of the challenges noted is when you use a non-sporicidal agent, these have been noted to have been shown to promote sporulation of hypervirulent strains like NAP1. So if you're using non-sporicidal agents and they get exposed to NAP1, that actually causes it to spore more and become a harder, difficult to, uh, to disinfect and read organism. Uh, published literature has also shown that as levels of environmental contamination increase, so does the prevalence of C. difficile uh, in the hand carriage as far as healthcare workers. So this is a clinical picture of what you're seeing when you're cleaning. All this to be said, and just to summarize, if you notice the Swiss cheese effect, if those perfect holes all line up, which they do in many clinical settings, you have a situation of those asymptomatic carriers, the non-sporicidal agents the C. difficile tenacity and being difficult to disinfect and read, the toilet leads and the fecal management, missed lab diagnosis and those challenges, poor hand hygiene compliance, missed case identification, those gentle surfaces that you have to clean and read, all this can line up to create a very, a very uh, difficult situation for managing of C. difficile. So one of the things that has been asked in the literature so far is show, should we screen everyone? Should we be looking at seeing whether everyone has C. difficile and then making the appropriate recommendation to then appropriately disinfect up at that point? But it's nice to know that this has been done and this was a subject of a debate at ID Week last week. And one of the things that was talked about is, well, you could do that. And this was a study that was done by Yves Longton and was published in, in JAMA um, in 2016. And one of the things that they noticed was if you looked at all emergency department admissions and you isolated them and then you screen them uh, while, while you're deciding what, what, what C. difficile status they have. If they are positive, then you continue to isolate them and if they're negative, then they don't get isolation. One of the things that they noticed was there was a 63% reduction in hospital acquired cases. In addition to that, they noticed that 5% of all patients that were swabbed were noted to be carriers of C. difficile. So this in itself just speaks to the complexity of C. difficile and creates the need to actually think differently in terms of our current strategy. So this is 2016 in terms of the work that's being done. And this is now where we transition to the recommendation that I, I would like to propose in terms of where we are now. Uh, based on the complexity that has been painted already and based on the developing uh, pathogenesis related to the complexity of C. difficile, I would say regardless of when the status is known of the patient, whether they are symptomatic or not, whether they are positive and still on treatment, or whether they're just positive plainly, the strategy is to actually go through and use parasitical agents on all these cases. Um, and the reason for that would be, as, as, as already mentioned, and, and going a little bit deeper in here, uh, some of the reasons are, I think it's important to understand that C. difficile exists in two forms. So there's a non-spore form and there's a spore form. When you're looking at the spore form and when I speak to context of sporicide, and I think this is something that's evolving. When people speak about sporicide, the typical understanding is a sporicide is a disinfectant that's a liquid. But sporicide definitely would be speaking to anything that has efficacy against that bug. So currently, the, as far as listed sporicidal agents, um, uh, according to the EPA, the, there's a link there to the EPA to, to verify some of those uh, disinfectants. But one of the two is the sodium hypochlorite as well as parasitic uh, uh, acid with the hydrogen peroxide combination. In addition to that, there's also non-touch sporicidal uh, devices. So you can use ultraviolet light, fogging systems, or different spray systems. But for the purpose of this talk, as I said, it's just a high level thing. I'm not diving too much deep into terms of like which uh, product has uh, best recommendations and so on. But what it's important to take away from this slide really is when people say sporicide, there's a multiple strategies that you can employ, ranging from disinfectants that are liquid to non-touch. In addition, it's important to appreciate that C. difficile exists in two forms, that spore form and non-spore form. And the spore form is the one that can create a bit of complexity. So Transitioning a little bit to, to disinfectants, as we're talking about these disinfectants, it's important to know uh, the, the appropriate thought process to employ when you're deciding on a disinfectant. And, and this is some work done by Rutala and Weber in 2014, where they created a scoring sheet related to how to go about deciding on what uh, I, I, ideal disinfectant. And they spoke about kill claims, safety, and, and these kind of things here. Yeah, but I think it's important to have that in your back pocket as you're deciding on what kind of disinfectants to use. Um, in the literature right now, these are the reasons cited to actually use sporicidal agents. Though 
currently the recommendation limits towards using them in, in, in certain settings, but it speaks to the efficacy of, of sporicidal agents. It also speaks to the guidance documents also point out that you want to be using sporicidal agents in certain settings where patients are actually identified as being positive. But what I'm going to propose is these are the reasons where these are not actually captured right now, and I feel subsequent revisions of the uh, guidance documents will actually pay more attention to these things. And one of the things is asymptomatic colonization or carriers, these do play a role, as I pointed earlier. There's also a significant error reduction that can happen or human factors considerations as illustrated by the Swiss cheese effect that I showed where you want to make sure that you have that strategy to mitigate that risk of missed case identification or of missed knowing what the patient's status is. In addition to that, there's hypervirulent strains that I've already, as I've pointed to, if you use non-sporocidal agents on these hypervirulent strains, what it does is it triggers them to sporulate even more, which can create now a more complicated situation for management. The last piece there, I think, is changing our infection prevention strategy to be prevention rather than just the control piece. So if you are preventing, you are actually proactive and you're looking to be proactive rather than reactive. So this really speaks to some of those things. And that's really the, the red piece is not something that's in the guidance documents right now. But I think with the subsequent literature that we're facing right now, this will all drive the thought process to, to, to affect that uh, guidance documents as we go. So the other piece is I think sporocidal agents do get better C. difficile log reduction. And this is something that Drutala has proved in a couple of cases, and Gonzalez in 2015 has also proved. But I'll go through this with you. Essentially, what it speaks to is meticulous cleaning with any cleaner slash disinfectant reduces the number of spores in the environment. However, greater log reduction and inactivation of spores is achieved when sporocidal agent is used. So this is something that they've noticed in their, in their, in their settings. Uh, removal of spores influenced by contact time, in brackets, duration of wetness, and texture of surface being cleaned. So I think, just to put it simply, if you look at technique there, there's wiping with any disinfectant, there's spraying with no wipe, uh, and then there's wiping with a sporocyte. If you look at the log reduction, the most significant log reduction was wiping with a sporocyte. Right. Uh, that's, that's a key takeaway from that, and that's one of the governing ideas in terms of like making people know what to be going with as far as uh, making decisions. But what you want to be looking at is this is work from 2015. And I think the reason why I want you to draw attention to 2015 and some of these later dates is you, you notice when we start talking, talking about the guidance documents that frame our current practice, some of this information didn't actually exist. So one of the things I wanted to really make clear is a lot of people have also started looking at using sporocidal agents indiscriminately throughout their facility. And this is a study that was done in uh, where Orenstein uh, published that uh, before and after study at two high-risk medical wards. What they did is for daily and terminal cleaning of all rooms, um, they changed out their quaternary ammonium compound from their before uh, product to hypochlorite wipes and what they noticed is that there was uh, from 24.2 to 3.6 cases per 10,000 patient days which was an 85% decline. So it seems like this stuff works so like why why wouldn't people use it and I think that these are some of the reasons and this is the result of the survey uh, that we just did uh, when you registered and, and this is telling actually and it speaks to some of the challenges and frustration that people that are looking to move to sporocidal face. So the question that was asked is why do you dislike sporocidal agents and, and anyone that does qualitative uh, research would know that I, 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 I intentionally skewed it in a way to actually get the negative aspects of this so 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 please let, let lay, out, lay uh, off the criticism in terms of what that looks like. But I think it's important to take away from here that one of the key things was that damage to equipment was a key thing. Um, there was a group that said other, we couldn't distill down in terms of what that was, but there was also a lot of fear around the smell, residue, and also cost. Uh, there was 1.64% people, uh, percent people that felt that it didn't work. Uh, but that just generally speaks to some of the challenges. But in addition to that, I think it's important to know that despite the concerns against foresightal use, there is some work that's being done. And I think some of the concerns, again, to distill and match with the previous survey, some of the other concerns are really around safety, um, damage to equipment, uh, damage to the patient equipment or the uh, certain surface or the environment, and a bit of concerns around cost. Uh, last but not least was that 
the guidance documents, unfortunately, right now, creates a limitation for certain people to feel that they can go above and beyond the recommendations of the guidance documents. So these are some of the reasons cited by some people when they are feeling that they cannot use borosidal use throughout. From an occupational health concern, I, I think it's important to acknowledge that too, and I think this is work done by Dr. Weber and Rutala, and what they noticed is uh, they did occupational health assessment of germicides in the healthcare space, and they made two conclusions. The first conclusion was healthcare occupational uh, clinical symptoms such as dermatitis, respiratory symptoms, and asthma, for example, um, as a result of chemical exposures were really, really low and exceedingly rare. Um, in addition to that, they, they also concluded that the scientific evidence itself does not support that the use of low-level disinfectants by healthcare professionals is an important risk for development of asthma or contact dermatitis. So this is some of the work that they found and, and I think there they exists potential to build on this work and see what, what can be done. But I think it, despite these challenges, here's more, more proof of concept, and this is a facility-wide uh, implementation of uh, sporicidal use. This was, I think, was done in New York, uh, Kimberly Aronholt and et al. And what they notice is bleach wipes can be found, uh, can be used for both daily and discharge cleaning of patient rooms, little impact on patient or employee satisfaction. Uh, and the second thing they noticed was involving patients in process improvement decisions assured staff-driven improvements are tolerated and accepted by patients. And in addition, they noticed an 85% 85, 85 decrease in C. difficile facility-wide. But what I'd like to draw attention to in this paper is that collaborative uh, effort in process improvement where you engage all the key stakeholders, including the patient. This is another work that was proven, and what they noticed is, this is a New York metropolitan region, and what they noticed is uh, environmental cleaning approach uh, needs standardized cleaning using a sodium hypochlorite disinfectant for both routine and terminal cleaning, and what, they, what was the clinical outcomes is they noticed a significant reduction in hospital onset C. difficile rates in the participating New York metropolitan regional hospitals, which they quantified between two to 2.6 to 6.8 million in estimated savings. So this is some of the stuff that showed that the stuff works. And as I said, sporocyte also goes into other different products. I'm just going to point that there's a lot of work being done as far as non-touch systems. Uh, this is actually a really good slide with all the comprehensive work that's being done. I've just highlighted two studies there at the bottom, which are the two most recent. One is by Anderson, uh, Devrick, Devrick Anderson at, at uh, UNC, and they've actually shown randomized control studies related to that. The other one is by Pergs uh, and et al. And what they notice is that there is a significant reduction in, 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 in cases. But what I think is important about these two studies is they both had the assessment of hand hygiene compliance and they also proved that there was assessment of environmental cleaning. So whenever you're making decisions, just make sure you're looking at any of those two pieces. So I would like to go in and transition a little bit to some call to action and recap in terms of where we stand. So this is the lay of the land, right? We've got a lot of things that can cause errors and challenges. Um, Hebden and et al., what they notice is there's a successful translation of evidence-based practice guidelines requires that the work system as well as the behavioral patterns of the providers are addressed. So in any given situation where you have clinical work being guided by guidance documents, those need to be clearly laid out in a way that factors in the work that's currently being done. The current, I I postulate that the current situation that we're in creates a bit of a challenge at the bedside in terms of decisions being made and opens up to some of those opportunities and, and challenges. So at the end of the day, I, I, I was trying to figure this out and one of the things I noticed was Prior to, if you look at this busy slide, but if you notice on the x-axis, on the sorry, on the vertical axis, you've got the number of journals that that have been published in the last little while, going up to 4,000, and this is through PubMed, and then you've got the the the, the horizontal axis talking to the, the the two different bars there. The one, the first bar between 1935 and 2007 is really the the number of literature that was available. So slightly over 2,000 papers were available. Uh, something happened in the middle there where there's a star and that's where most of the guidance documents were born. After those guidance documents were born and circulated, there was a significant spike in literature that's available. So you're looking at about 3,700 papers between that 2008 to 2016. 
I feel we're getting into a special era now where the Red Star is there, where you're now having a plethora, a huge significant volume base of information that will now feed into the guidance document. So some of the things that I'm talking about now that I talked about prog at progressive conferences related to the role of asymptomatic colonization, related to the possible use of universal sports settle use, these are the things that I feel will be addressed in subsequent versions of the guidance document. But until then, I felt it's, uh, it, this is an important thing to share. Currently, there was an evaluation of all the guidance documents related to C. difficile, and out of a out of a significant sample of all the the, the 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 documents, only five were eligible for assessment. So two that we already know that drive infection control practice are the APIC 2013 document and the Shea IDSA 2014 document. So this is a paper, by the way, that will be that's in each year uh, published in August. But what they did is a systematic survey of all the, the guidance documents and they voted them against the agree uh, domain, which is a, a criteria to assess. One of the things that they concluded is most all the guidance documents right now, and I'm going down to the point at the bottom now, is number one, that there's a considerable need for high quality clinical uh, practice guidelines because they are often used for patient care. The second piece was future guidelines for C. difficile prevention should be developed using validated methodol methodological standards. And the third piece was there's a need for higher quality primary research on this topic to better inform the recommendations. In actual fact, one of the other takeaways was all the guidance documents did not meet the current recommendations to meet the stringent requirements that are normally given for clinical-based practice guidelines. So this is important and interesting as we're now looking for new revised guidance documents over the next little while. A key take out of this situation is when you look at C. difficile interventions that are currently in play, hand hygiene is done all the time. Antimicrobial stewardship before was just targeted to acute care settings, but right now a lot of work is being done by the CDC to actually start looking at antimicrobial stewardship all the time. When you look at C. difficile disinfection with osphorocyte, this is a vertical targeted intervention, which I feel over the next little while and based on the literature as it's developing and the revision of the guidance documents, it's going to be a matter of time before that slides into that all the time. And it's also important to note that many facilities have already started doing it all the time anyway, but they're facing significant challenges, which I'm going to speak to a bit. But I think what is important to note is that error reduction and safety by use of osphorocyte or ages everywhere deals with two things. One, it does not require people to change the way they work, which is a red bottom there. It actually replaces the hazard of, of error, which is a more effective strategy. So this is a, uh, CDC uses this as a hierarchy of control, where you always want to play is where you eliminate the risk. So you're always looking at the, to play at the bottom of, at the top of the triangle there. And it seems right now, changing the way people work by trying to identify the rooms appropriately, by trying to know when to use the sports idol appropriately, it opens them up to so much behavioral challenges and, 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 and Swiss cheese type um, mistakes. So I basically propose that that's the way that we'll be going. But one of the things is I, I, I always look at this, and this is something that always grounds me. A couple of years ago, working in a healthcare setting, I was approached by a nurse, an environmental service worker that had worked 20 years in the facility. And one of the things she asked me at the time was, Bali, there seems to be a cyclical pa pattern, that, pa pattern that happens here. We have a C. difficile outbreak. We introduce a sporocyte. The outbreak is removed, and we remove the sporocyte. And this process happens over and over again. So it led me to start thinking, and I think this is where we are now as a result of this journey, but I think ultimately when uh, some of the recommendations and some of the feedback from the survey was really around an ideal disinfectant could be something that would have better surface compatibility, faster contact times, and minimal occupational health concerns. In addition, having updated guidance documents that reflect the current changes, such as the complexity of C. difficile transmission and the uh, asymptomatic colonization, as well as uh, considerations of the, the, the new data that's available could be a good thing. Uh, and the third piece is just improving surfaces and equipment. Uh, unfortunately, right now with uh, certain equipment going into healthcare settings that requires to be cleaned by gentle soap and lint-free cloths, that doesn't work for, for, for the type of bacteria that we face in these environments. So you're definitely looking to have tougher surfaces, special covers in there, procurement, looking at the type of equipment that's coming in and it has to be hardy. And this is going to be something that's going to be driven through infection control and environmental services and advocacy at these discussions through purchasing. 
So just to summarize where we're at right now, and I think some of the key takes in terms of, of what what we're looking at right now, I, I, I feel and I think the data show, shows and points out that there's multiple sources of C. difficile transmission. Um, asymptomatic carriage is definitely a relevant challenge. Uh, it's something that we're facing. In addition to that, human factors is an important consideration in hospital disinfecting. You cannot uh, expect people to not make mistakes when they are asked to use uh, uh, sporocidal use uh, in, in targeted situations because there is delayed uh, diagnosis, there is delayed case identification, and now with complex uh, transmission pathways both from the home and people now being taken care of in so many settings, it opens up so much significant challenge in terms of managing this. The other thing is, I, in understanding that people would might would consider going to sporocidal use if there was better products, it's also important to note that better innovation on disinfections is needed, and this is something that many people would require to have a call to action to to strategize and get that going. The guidance documents are up for renewal, and I'm super excited about that because I think it opens up an opportunity for renewed dialogue and discussion. And lastly, universal sporocidal disinfectant use is an effective C. difficile control strategy. This has been documented and displayed a couple of times in, 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 in some of the data I provided today, and I, and I would urge anyone that's actually participating in any of these kind of interventions to really publish, because when you publish, it creates that uh, repository of information and helps everyone else have uh, necessary uh, information to make decisions from. With that, I, I come to the end, and I've already attached as well the BECA pre-registration survey um, in case uh, when they share the conversation with that. And with that, I thank you for your attention, and I think we can open up for questions. Great. Barley, thank you so much. We've got a number of questions from the audience. Let me start with a couple of those. And let me encourage the audience to continue to enter questions. And if you have them, uh, and if need be, we'll go a few minutes past the hour, which is uh, just terrific. So, Barley, let me start with this. And thank you for your presentation. Have you used sporocidal agents successfully? Have you seen them used successfully? So that's a that's a very good question, and uh, I can draw from my personal experience, and then I can dive into the literature a little bit. Um, in two clinical settings that I worked, one as an infection preventionist and one as the manager of infection prevention and control, uh, we successfully deployed a broad universal sporocidal use throughout the facility, and we noticed our um, the C. difficile incident rates decline uh, significantly. Uh, and some of that work we 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 published, but in addition to that, I think. Some of the articles that I pointed out in, in, that are in the literature, and I think Orenstein out of New York and a couple of other people that have done work right now have shown that this is definitely a strategy that can be useful. But one of the things that they still point to is it needs to be a collaborative strategy. Bring the environmental service into the room, talk to them, patient care, make it uh, a collaborative decision. But yes, to answer your question more succinctly, yes, I've seen uh, effective strategies related to that. Thank you. Emma, I'm going to just ask you one question so we can take it off the list. Will the slides be available for people that want to see the slides afterwards? Yes, absolutely. We will be sending a copy of the slides and a recording of the webinar to all registrants within about a week of the presentation today. Thank you very much. So that answers that question. And Barley and Clorox, thank you. Barley, your thoughts on disinfection of floors. The question is, we routinely get pushback on disinfecting floors from staff. Any thoughts on that? Is that something you could comment on? It's it's interesting because the the, the floor as a as a as a. Um, as a transmitter of C. difficile is something that's making a huge resurgence. And, and in my travels, I get to hear a lot of work related to that. Um, the, the, there's some work coming out of England right now with John Otter. John Otter, is, uh, he, he runs, he runs a, a lab in, in, in England, and he also does work related to pathogenesis and spread of C. difficile. And one of the things that they're noticing is Th th that you can have some C. difficile on, 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 on the floor as far as surfaces, but one of the things that people always look at is high touch surfaces. So you always have to aggregate your interventions. The floor is one piece, but in terms of frequency of contamination, you, when you're looking at, uh, at spreading yourself into different interventions, the focus then becomes more around the high touch surfaces, and the floor, unfortunately, is not identified as one. That being said, 
the challenge that's happening is, as I say, the body of work is developing. There's not a substantial body of work right now, but it's no surprise that in the next little while we might see more. But currently where we stand, priority is given to the high-touch surfaces that are the ones closest to the patient, the bedside rail, the, the, the table, and that kind of stuff, the call bell, and so on. And, and what about soft surfaces? There was a question about disinfecting a patient's mattress, which can be sort of the middle of, of certain types of issues uh, with diarrhea and so forth but then concerns about using harsh bleaches and so forth on mattresses in terms of voiding the manufacturer's warranty and so forth. Any thoughts on this issue generally of soft surfaces and, and using sporocytals or disinfecting soft surfaces? So I, I can speak on that from a personal perspective and having, having worked in clinical settings. Uh, one of the things that we always did is on acquisition of product, we would actually reach out to the manufacturer themselves and say, this is a clinical setting, this is a product that we're going to use maybe in our intensive care unit, it's a mattress, and we want to be able to use it in this kind of settings, right? And in that conversation, we would actually then speak to them as far as like, what can we do as far as either getting surface compatibility testing with particular by manufacturers X, Y, and Z, because ultimately the, there's a due diligence that's required from, as I said, I'm speaking from a personal perspective here, from an infection prevention control perspective. When you look at the criteria for decision making, the criteria for decision making according to CBIC and the CIC certification is you want to have one, a decision model that's built on safety of the patient right? Secondly, you want to have safety for the staff. And then third piece is that that financial responsibility piece. So this is the criteria in which you employ your decision. So when you now are deciding on a surface that's a soft surface, using the same thought process and algorithm, if you really think about it, if you're putting a surface that's not safe for the patient and cannot handle the hardy requirements of disinfectant, then you're actually putting the patient at risk. So then that tips that equation back to start thinking, okay, so what kind of surfaces are we putting in here and can they handle that? And there's now a lot of work that's being done around soft surface claims. And I think uh, they, that, that's certain links and stuff that I can share with the, uh, with the supplement, Emma, if, if, if there's a need. Thank you very much. What are your thoughts regarding UV disinfection as an adjunct measure for cleaning? Any thoughts on that, Farley? So, so in my case, I get really excited when people say UV and, and cleaning because I think it's important to understand one thing, UV disinfects. So the, and I'm just going to go quickly here, but cleaning and disinfecting are two fundamental different things. So cleaning is a precursor to disinfecting. With cleaning, you're physically removing debris. You're taking items off a surface, so that it's in pathogenic or non-pathogenic or whatever else, you're taking them off a surface so that you can disinfect. So now that being said, UV definitely has been shown, and I think some of the work, Rutal, uh, sorry, Devrick Anderson, I think 2015 uh, is one of the last pieces of work that's been shared, but what they are noticing is it is a definite good complement to proper cleaning processes. So it does not replace your cleaning, but it's an adjunct and a necessary adjunct at that because it gets to certain nooks and crannies that certain people might not get to. In addition to that, God. it also solves some of the other challenges that people have, uh, have around you know, surface compatibility. So you can use UV on your screen, but you cannot necessarily use a harsh chemical on your screen. So it checks off certain balances, but that being said, it's got its advantages and disadvantages. Gotcha. Next question. What what things should people consider when they're considering switching disinfectants? What are the kinds of things they analyze and considerations in making changes? So I, I think th th that's a good question, but I, I think the, 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 the nicest tool that's out there is the tool by Rutala, uh, where they did the 10-point gauging system. I think the, this was one of my slides there. But what you always want to think about is what bug are you trying to kill? What challenges are you facing in your facility? So once again, that local epidemiology piece is important. So you've got to be answering those questions. If C. difficile is your challenge, you need to make sure you have the right tool. If you're facing a challenge with gram-negative bacteria, most of, the most of the products that are out there will work for that. But you want to be thinking about really, does this complement my current strategy. In addition to that, you're already also looking at, once again, we talked about human factors. So you've got to be thinking about ready to use. You've got to be thinking about reducing the risk that's pre presented by many steps 
because people in healthcare are so busy right now. And honestly, I, 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 my heart goes to them. And, and you want to make sure you have the necessary tools to complement their practice. So those are some of the things that you want to be thinking about. No, thank you, thank you. So really, you have to be very specific as to what you're trying to attack as you look Absolutely. at deciding to switch. Got it. That is helpful. A, a, a measurement of using spray versus wipe forms. Are any thoughts on spray versus wipe? And so spray and wipe is 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 one of those issues that I, once again is, is a contentious point, and I think it's important to understand the backstory of sprays. So sprays in the current guidance documents cites information from the 70s and 80s related to potential aerosolization of bacteria. It also speaks to potential aerosolization of the spray chemical itself. What has happened since then, and once again, this speaks to that, that chasm that I spoke to about information that's available at the time of creating guidance documents and subsequent development. What has happened since then is there's been a lot more work done around the, the trigger sprays related to many devices. There's been a lot of work related to um, occupational uh, exposure limits, and there's a lot of work done around uh, different PPE that's required. So at the end of the day, when you factor in all those pieces together, spray is definitely something that's coming into the mix. And I'm optimistic that future recommendations and future guidance documents will definitely speak to this. And actually, in one of the slides that I showed that had work from Rutala and, and so on, did speak to how spray was actually better than certain other interventions. So you got to look at that in, in the full context, but you want to be taking a full clinical picture as you're making these recommendations and, and conclusions. Thank you. There's, there's a couple related questions, and I thought we'd try and tackle those. Your thoughts on using sporocytals on copper-infused surfaces, curtains, and patient bed covers. And I'm not sure the patient bed cover doesn't sort of touch on an issue you talked about earlier, but the three issues were copper-infused surfaces, curtains, and patient bed covers. Any thoughts on that? So I think the biggest, uh, so I think out of that, I think you always want to look at surface compatibility. The, the, the easiest way to answer that, and I've had to answer that question many a time during my days of managing um, infection control programs, because you always get that call, hey, my, my IP, I've got this piece of equipment that's now available. How do I disinfect it? And how do I clean it? The, 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 the best way is at the very entry level, you've got to understand what they call the spalding, the spalding principle around what it's being used as. If it's, a, if it's not, not going through an invasive device and, and it's just low-level disinfectant, you also now want to go to the next layer, which is confirming with the manufacturer in terms of what their recommendations are. So those are the two pieces that you want to be looking at. But copper itself is a new player, and I think a lot of work is being done around minimizing oxida oxidation agents uh, as far as disinfectants, and they may be going for more like uh, subtle sanitizers. But I, I, it's something that I can share once again with links afterwards, Emma, if, uh, if, you, can be, if you can remind me, I can share some uh, corresponding work related to that. Thank you very much. And I know one of the one of the asters uh, modified my question, which I probably didn't hit quite perfectly, Barley. But let me ask you a couple other questions. The there's there's questions about variations in reporting, and I think the question is referring to a variation reportings of infections. The same questioner had a um, had a had a question on: Is anyone using EO water? And is there anything you could tell us about those two issues, variations in reporting, and I'm not sure if that if you if you, if you means related to use of different approaches or about infections, and also the use of EO water. Is that either of those? I can I can take the first one. I'll I'll, I'll stay away from the second one. Um, in terms of the first one, I think it's important to understand that infection control and, and pre infection prevention control is based around surveillance definitions. So there needs to be consistency in the way we classify cases and classify uh, whether a case is hospital acquired and so on. A lot of work is being done around inter inter like different variability between different people that are documenting a case. One of the things that's also seen is early on in the month when you have less cases, you call it lighter than later on in the month when you're having higher number of cases because you're now teetering around the outbreak piece. All these two pieces really speak to the opportunity around consistency in, in, um, 
in calling cases. But that being said, right now there's a lot of work being done around trying to look at whether by microbiology, which is more objective, can you then be able to call a case through objective ways. But until that's being done, right now unfortunately it leaves it to a lot of subjective cases. As I said in my talk earlier on, is it a stool? Is it not loose? Is a person in a diaper? Is it two cases? Is it three stool? Like it opens up to so many variabilities, which honestly I empathize with the, with the audience in terms of those challenges. Another question relates to environmental contamination of patient supplies that are stored in patient rooms or brought into patient rooms. You know, what do you do with those at discharge? Are there core concepts or right or thoughts on what to do about patient supplies brought into rooms, whether they should be discarded at discharge or just let the patient take them? And I take it they mean in a situation where there's been a good chance of infection or there's been infection. Any thoughts on that, Barley? I think with that one, honestly, it opens up. It's one of those questions that's very difficult to give a recommendation on, but I think the key piece there is to stick to the infection prevention control uh, guidance documents and the recommendations, which are if something has been in a patient environment, it might be potentially contaminated. So you err on the side of caution. Um, without knowing on a case-by-case -case basis, I do know there is work that's being done right now around using uh, of high, high hydrogen peroxide vapor devices to try and make sure that those, device, those products can be reused. But that's exploratory and honestly, at the present moment, the most of the recommendations are err on the side of caution and minimize the those actions. Gotcha. Let me do this. I want to keep going and welcome people to stay on the phone for a few more minutes as long as Barley can do so. I also want to take a second. I've gotten a couple comments thanking Barley and Clorox just for an excellent presentation. So I want to thank you for that as well. So thank anybody who's on, please feel, please feel free to stay on and we'll keep going for a few more moments because we've got some more questions here to answer and thank you. Um, thank you. Anything that you recommend specifically for floors to myth, minimize pathogens from traveling from room to room. And I know you're not going to talk about specific products, but, but anything you recommendations generally on issues with floors and minimizing travel from, from room to room. So I, I think in, in, in cases like that, as far as like sports traveling from room to room, I think I'll refer people to breaking the chain of infection. And I think once again, it comes down to minimizing uh, traffic to those particular settings and having a product that has appropriate efficacy for those particular pathogens of concern. So this is where you now start looking into potentially having the um, the 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 potential UV light and other non-touch devices that can actually have a more extensive coverage. But once again, it speaks to, in the context of C. difficile, having the necessary product that can allow you to have that expanded coverage. So that's really what it comes down to. But without, as I said, I'm going to stay away from making product recommendations, but in terms of product classes, you definitely want to be playing in that sporicidal class, and you want to be playing in the non-touch decontamination uh, class that has sporicidal efficacy. Great. There's a couple comments on just the multi-factor challenges of C. diff, and you've really talked about that. Um, so I'm not going to ask that question because it's more of a comment than, than a question. Is there a guideline to replace the curtain after um, C. diff? So it, 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 and should all soft surfaces be wandered with sodium? I, I'm not pronouncing this correct because it's cut off here, but sodium hypochlorite. Yeah, so there is guidance document recommendations as far as frequency for curtain changes. Um, and I think whether it's the APIC 2013 document or the IDSA SHEA document, or if you're more in Canada, the uh, Provincial Infectious Disease Advisory Committee PIDAC document, each of those have their own share of recommendations. I will not speak to the particular one, but I can share those links because, by, because each have geographic limitations. And in addition to that, each facility has its own minimum recommendations based on its policy. But to, to, to answer it more succinct, succinctly, there is geographic recommendations by provincial, by, by provincial or regional guidance documents. And, and Barley, just a couple questions left, and I appreciate our audience. A great deal runs to stay on all the way through your questions, which is a real tribute to your uh, expertise on the subject. Have you used photocatalytics? 
I, I'm familiar with photocatalytics, and I think a lot of work is being done out of uh, BC. Dr. Bryce uh, is doing a lot of extensive work related to that. I think she's published two articles in uh, American Journal of Infection Control. Uh, I think a March issue came out this year, and I think she's actually having one that's an EPUB uh, version that just came out. And Yes, I have familiarity with that, and I think the bulk of that work is done in the context of nasal work, in particular MRSA, uh, but I, I, I'm open to, to learning more if, if it has other applications related to C. difficile, but to my knowledge, I think it's localized and limited to MRSA intervention, in particular the uh, nasal work. The next question is an interesting question, just a, a very uh, patient family question. Any issues with the smell of some of the disinfectants that, that people have had? Is there any comment on that, or is it just really all over the board depending on how strong rooms got to be disinfected and what you're using? Absolutely. Smell is definitely one of those things that's cited in, in, in most foricidal products. And I'm going to say products because UV lights, when people use them, they actually complain of a certain smell that comes out of that. When people use sodium hypochlorite, they do complain of that bleachy smell. When people use high concentrations of parasitic acid or hydrogen peroxide, they do cite smell. Um, and I think what, what, is, what is interesting is you can put a random sample of people in a room and some people will love some of those smells and some people won't love them. But I think what it comes down to is, is that smell harmful? And I think that's where by, we're lucky to have EPA, uh, we're lucky to have OSHA and other governing bodies that can actually do those validations and tell you what is an occupational exposure limit. So I think educating environmental services and infection control to be able to speak well to what that smell means and whether there's any harm or not is more important than just that subjective idea of smell. It's important to quantify what it means and whether if or not there is any harm. <laughs> Thank you. Got it. And then I think the other issue that was asked, but I think we already asked it in a different way, what are some key considerations in change management? And I think you really sort of answered that question, but correct me, Barley, or jump in. Anything you want to further add on in this issue? Because we talked about it some in choices to change disinfectants and approaches. Any other key considerations in change management that you wanted to touch on again? Yeah, I, I think for me, change management is 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 exactly about putting yourself in an empath in an empathy based position, right? Put yourself in the shoes of the person that's having to change. It's easy to tell somebody else to change something rather than to change yourself. So when you have to tell people to change stuff, you have to be coming from the place of what are they giving up and how can I engage them in that change? So a lot of work around positive deviance is being done. A lot of work around frontline ownership is being done. So there's a lot of work that's being done now really around understanding how to think in in the perspective of the the person that's being asked to change. And infection control itself is premised on that particular reason. So when you're looking at change management, it's integral and critical to really know the right things to engage the person and to understand what's in it for them. So all those are just basic key principles. And I think I could come back and do another talk just entirely on change management because it's a, it's a, it's a thing I love so, so much. But I think it comes down essentially to how can you have empathy? Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. I think, Barley, we're about wrapped up on questions. Um, did you have anything that you wanted to add still at all on in, in wrapping up? Or are you, this is a magnificent presentation. Most all the audience stayed on throughout the entire presentation and most of the questions. Uh, and, and the nice thing about it, we thank you, we thank Clorox immensely the best of these presentations do very little quote unquote selling and you did a wonderful job of explaining and educating the audience and we very much appreciate Clorox and you doing exactly that. Just a magnificent presentation. Thank you. I truly appreciate it. And I'd I like to thank uh, you, uh, you, you for the phenomenal uh, facilitation and, and having me and Emma for the phenomenal work in, 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 in teeing this up. And also, I'd like to thank everyone that stayed on. And, and honestly, I, I feel like it's a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a love type thing around managing C. difficile and, and trying to help and, and reduce the infections. And I, and I thank you for all the work that you guys do out there. And coming onto this call is, a, is an example of the dedication that's required. And feel free to reach out if there's any way I can assist. Thank you very much. We'll, we'll, we'll wrap up. 
Emma, Barley, great call, and Clorox, thank you so much. That, that, that's it for today. Thanks, folks. Thank you very much.